The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne. We're beginning part two, entitled Abandoned. This is part two, chapter one. It was now exactly seven months since the balloon voyagers had been thrown on Lincoln Island. During that time, notwithstanding the researches they had made, no human being had been discovered. No smoke even had betrayed the presence of man on the surface of the island. No vestiges of his handiwork showed that either at an early or at a late period had man lived there. Not only did it now appear to be uninhabited by any but themselves, but the colonists were compelled to believe that it had never been inhabited. And now all this scaffolding of reasonings fell before a simple ball of metal found in the body of an inoffensive rodent. In fact, this bullet must have issued from a firearm, and who but a human being could have used such a weapon? When Pencroft had placed the bullet on the table, his companions looked at it with intense astonishment. All the consequences likely to result from this incident, notwithstanding its apparent insignificance, immediately took possession of their minds. The sudden apparition of a supernatural being could not have startled them more completely. Cyrus Harding did not hesitate to give utterance to the suggestions which this fact, at once surprising and unexpected, could not fail to raise in his mind. He took the bullet, turned it over and over, rolled it between his finger and thumb. Then, turning to Pencroft, he asked, "'Are you sure that the peccary wounded by this bullet was not more than three months old?' "'Not more, Captain,' replied Pencroft. "'It was still sucking its mother when I found it in the trap.' "'Well,' said the engineer, "'that proves that within three months a gunshot was fired in Lincoln Island.' "'And that a bullet,' added Gideon Spilett, "'wounded, though not mortally, this little animal.' "'That is unquestionable,' said Cyrus Harding. "'And these are the deductions which must be drawn from this incident, "'that the island was inhabited before our arrival, "'or that men have landed here within three months. "'Did these men arrive here voluntarily or involuntarily, "'by disembarking on the shore, or by being wrecked? "'This point can only be cleared up later. "'As to what they were, Europeans or Malays, enemies or friends of our race we cannot possibly guess and if they still inhabit the island or if they have left it we know not but these questions are of too much importance to be allowed to remain long unsettled no a hundred times no a thousand times no cried the sailor springing up from the table there are no other men than ourselves on lincoln island by my faith the island isn't large and if it had been inhabited, we should have seen some of the inhabitants long before this. "'In fact, the contrary would be very astonishing,' said Herbert. "'But it would be much more astonishing, I should think,' observed the reporter, "'if this peccary had been born with a bullet in its inside.' "'At least,' said Neb seriously, "'if Pencroft has not had—' "'Look here, Neb!' burst out Pencroft. Do you think I could have a bullet in my jaw for five or six months without finding it out? Where could it be hidden? he asked, opening his mouth to show the two and thirty teeth with which it was furnished. Look well, Neb, and if you find one hollow tooth in this set, I will let you pull out half a dozen. Neb's supposition is certainly inadmissible, replied Harding, who, notwithstanding the gravity of his thoughts, could not restrain a smile. It is certain that a gun has been fired in the island, within three months at most. But I am inclined to think that the people who landed on this coast were only here a short time ago, or that they just touched here. For if, when we surveyed the island from the summit of Mount Franklin, it had been inhabited, we should have seen them, or we should have been seen ourselves. It is therefore probable that only within a few weeks castaways have been thrown by a storm on some part of the coast. However that may be, it is of consequence to us to have this point settled. "'I think that we should act with caution,' said the reporter. "'Such is my advice,' replied Cyrus Harding. "'For it is to be feared that Malay pirates have landed on the island.' 
Captain, asked the sailor, would it not be a good plan, before setting out, to build a canoe in which we could either ascend the river, or, if we liked, coast round the island? It would not do to be unprovided. Your idea is good, Pencroft, replied the engineer. But we cannot wait for that. It would take at least a month to build a boat. Yes, a real boat, replied the sailor. But we do not want one for a sea voyage, and in five days at the most I will undertake to construct a canoe fit to navigate the Mercy. Five days, cried Neb, to build a boat? Yes, Neb, a boat in the Indian fashion. Of wood? asked the negro, looking still unconvinced. Of wood, replied Pencroft, or rather of bark. I repeat, Captain, that in five days the work will be finished. In five days, then, be it, replied the engineer. But till that time we must be very watchful, said Herbert. Very watchful indeed, my friends, replied Harding, and I beg you to confine your hunting excursions to the neighborhood of Granite House. The dinner ended less gaily than Pencroft had hoped. So then the island was, or had been, inhabited by others than the settlers. Proved as it was by the incident of the bullet, it was hereafter an unquestionable fact, and such a discovery could not but cause great uneasiness among the colonists. Cyrus Harding and Gideon Spilett, before sleeping, conversed long about the matter. They asked themselves if, by chance, this incident might not have some connection with the inexplicable way in which the engineer had been saved, and the other peculiar circumstances which had struck them at different times. However, Cyrus Harding, after having discussed the pros and cons of the question, ended by saying, "'In short, would you like to know my opinion, my dear Spilett?' "'Yes, Cyrus.' "'Well, then, it is this. However minutely we explore the island, we shall find nothing.' The next day Pencroft set to work. He did not mean to build a boat with boards and planking, but simply a flat-bottomed canoe, which would be well suited for navigating the Mercy, above all for approaching its source, where the water would naturally be shallow. Pieces of bark, fastened one to the other, would form a light boat, and in case of natural obstacles, which would render a portage necessary, it would be easily carried. Pencroft intended to secure the pieces of bark by means of nails, to ensure the canoe being water-tight. It was first necessary to select the trees which would afford a strong and supple bark for the work. Now the last storm had brought down a number of large birch trees, the bark of which would be perfectly suited for their purpose. Some of these trees lay on the ground, and they had only to be barked, which was the most difficult thing of all, owing to the imperfect tools which the settlers possessed. However, they overcame all difficulties. While the sailor, seconded by the engineer, thus occupied himself without losing an hour, Gideon Spilett and Herbert were not idle. They were made purveyors to the colony. The reporter could not but admire the boy, who had acquired great skill in handling the bow and spear. Herbert also showed great courage, and much of that presence of mind which may justly be called the reasoning of bravery. These two companions of the chase, remembering Cyrus Harding's recommendations, did not go beyond a radius of two miles round Granite House, but the borders of the forest furnished a sufficient tribute of agoutis, capybaras, kangaroos, peccaries, etc., and if the result from the traps was less than during the cold, still the warren yielded its accustomed quota, which might have fed all the colony in Lincoln Island. Often during these excursions Herbert talked with Gideon Spilett on the incident of the bullet, and the deductions which the engineer drew from it, and one day, it was the 26th of October, he said, "'But, Mr. Spilett, do you not think it very extraordinary that, if any castaways have landed on the island, they have not yet shown themselves near Granite House?' "'Very astonishing if they are still here,' replied the reporter, "'but not astonishing at all if they are here no longer.' "'So you think that these people have already quitted the island?' returned Herbert. It is more than probable, my boy, for if their stay was prolonged, 
and above all, if they were still here, some accident would have at last betrayed their presence. "'But if they are able to go away,' observed the lad, "'they could not have been castaways.' "'No, Herbert, or at least they were what might be called provisional castaways. It is very possible that a storm may have driven them to the island without destroying their vessel, and that, the storm over, they went away again. "'I must acknowledge one thing,' said Herbert. "'It is that Captain Harding appears rather to fear than desire the presence of human beings on our island.' "'In short,' responded the reporter, "'there are only Malays who frequent these seas, and those felons are ruffians which it is best to avoid.' "'It is not impossible, Mr. Spillett,' said Herbert, "'that some day or other we may find traces of their landing.' "'I do not say no, my boy. A deserted camp, the ashes of a fire, would put us on the track, and this is what we will look for in our next expedition.' The day on which the hunters spoke thus, they were in a part of the forest near the Mercy, remarkable for its beautiful trees. There, among others, rose to a height of nearly two hundred feet above the ground some of those superb coniferae to which, in New Zealand, the natives give the name of Kauris. "'I have an idea, Mr. Spillett,' said Herbert. "'If I were to climb to the top of one of these Kauris, I could survey the country for an immense distance round.' "'The idea is good,' replied the reporter. "'But could you climb to the top of those giants?' "'I can at least try,' replied Herbert. The light and active boy then sprang on the first branches, the arrangement of which made the ascent of the kauri easy, and in a few minutes he arrived at the summit, which emerged from the immense plain of verdure. From this elevated situation his gaze extended over all the southern portion of the island, from Claw Cape on the southeast to Reptile End on the southwest. To the northwest rose Mount Franklin, which concealed a great part of the horizon. But Herbert, from the height of his observatory, could examine all the yet unknown portion of the island which might have given shelter to the strangers whose presence they suspected. The lad looked attentively. There was nothing in sight on the sea, not a sail, neither on the horizon nor near the island. However, as the bank of trees hid the shore, it was possible that a vessel, especially if deprived of her masts, might lie close to the land and thus be invisible to Herbert. Neither in the forest of the far west was anything to be seen. The wood formed an impenetrable screen, measuring several square miles, without a break or an opening. It was impossible even to follow the course of the Mercy, or to ascertain in what part of the mountain it took its source. Perhaps other creeks also ran towards the west, but they could not be seen. But at last, if all indication of an encampment escaped Herbert's sight, could he not even catch a glimpse of smoke, the faintest trace of which would be easily discernible in the pure atmosphere? For an instant Herbert thought he could perceive a slight smoke in the west, but a more attentive examination showed that he was mistaken. He strained his eyes in every direction, and his sight was excellent. No. Decidedly, there was nothing there. Herbert descended to the foot of the kauri, and the two sportsmen returned to Granite House. There Cyrus Harding listened to the lad's account, shook his head, and said nothing. It was very evident that no decided opinion could be pronounced on this question until after a complete exploration of the island. Two days after, the 28th of October, another incident occurred for which an explanation was again required. While strolling along the shore about two miles from Granite House, Herbert and Neb were fortunate enough to capture a magnificent specimen of the order of Kelonia. It was a turtle of the species Midas, the edible green turtle, so called from the color both of its shell and fat. Herbert caught sight of this turtle as it was crawling among the rocks to reach the sea. "'Help, Neb, help!' he cried. Neb ran up. "'What a fine animal!' said Neb. "'But how are we to catch it?' "'Nothing is easier, Neb,' replied Herbert. 
We have only to turn the turtle on its back, and it can possibly get away. Take your spear and do as I do." The reptile, aware of danger, had retired between its carapace and plastron. They no longer saw its head or feet, and it was motionless as a rock. Herbert and Neb then drove their sticks underneath the animal, and by their united efforts managed without difficulty to turn it on its back. The turtle, which was three feet in length, would have weighed at least four hundred pounds. "'Capital!' cried Neb. "'This is something that will rejoice friend Pencroft's heart.' In fact, the heart of friend Pencroft could not fail to be rejoiced, for the flesh of the turtle, which feeds on rack grass, is extremely savoury. At this moment the creature's head could be seen, which was small, flat, but widened behind by the large temporal fosse hidden under the long roof. "'And now what shall we do with our prize?' said Neb. "'We can't drag it to Granite House.' "'Leave it here, since it cannot turn over,' replied Herbert, "'and we will come back with the cart to fetch it.' "'That is the best plan.' However, for greater precaution, Herbert took the trouble, which Neb deemed superfluous, to wedge up the animal with great stones, after which the two hunters returned to Granite House, following the beach, which the tide had left uncovered. Herbert, wishing to surprise Pencroft, said nothing about the superb specimen of a colonian, which they had turned over on the sand, but two hours later he and Neb returned with the cart to the place where they had left it. The superb specimen of a colonian was no longer there. Neb and Herbert stared at each other first, then they stared about them. It was just at this spot that the turtle had been left. The lad even found the stones which he had used, and therefore he was certain of not being mistaken. "'Well,' said Neb, "'these beasts can turn themselves over, then?' "'It appears so,' replied Herbert, who could not understand it at all, and was gazing at the stones scattered on the sand. "'Well, Pencroft will be disgusted, and Captain Harding will perhaps be very perplexed how to explain this disappearance,' thought Herbert. "'Look here,' said Neb, who wished to hide his ill luck. "'We won't speak about it.' "'On the contrary, Neb, we must speak about it,' replied Herbert. And the two, taking the cart, which there was now no use for, returned to Granite House." Arrived at the dockyard, where the engineer and the sailor were working together, Herbert recounted what had happened. "'Oh, the stupids!' cried the sailor, "'to have let at least fifty meals escape!' "'But, Pencroft,' replied Neb, "'it wasn't our fault that the beast got away. As I tell you, we had turned it over on its back.' "'Then you didn't turn it over enough,' returned the obstinate sailor. "'Not enough!' cried Herbert, and he told how he had taken care to wedge up the turtle with stones. "'It is a miracle, then,' replied Pencroft. "'I thought, Captain,' said Herbert, "'that turtles, once placed on their backs, could not regain their feet, especially when they are of a large size?' "'That is true, my boy,' replied Cyrus Harding. "'Then how did it manage?' "'At what distance from the sea did you leave this turtle?' asked the engineer, who, having suspended his work, was reflecting on this incident. Fifteen feet at the most,' replied Herbert. "'And the tide was low at the time?' "'Yes, Captain.' "'Well,' replied the engineer, "'what the turtle could not do on the sand it might have been able to do in the water. It turned over when the tide overtook it, and then quietly returned to the deep sea.' "'Oh, what stupids we were!' cried Neb. "'That is precisely what I had the honour of telling you before,' returned the sailor. Cyrus Harding had given this explanation, which no doubt was admissible, but was he himself convinced of the accuracy of this explanation? It cannot be said that he was. End of chapter The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne, Part Two, Chapter Two. On the ninth of October, the bark canoe was entirely finished. Pencroft had kept his promise, 
and a light boat, the shell of which was joined together by the flexible twigs of the krajimba, had been constructed in five days. A seat in the stern, a second seat in the middle to preserve the equilibrium, a third seat in the bows, rowlocks for the two oars, a skull to steer with, completed the little craft, which was twelve feet long and did not weigh more than two hundred pounds. The operation of launching it was extremely simple. The canoe was carried to the beach and laid on the sand before Granite House, and the rising tide floated it. Pencroft, who leaped in directly, maneuvered it with the skull and declared it to be just the thing for the purpose to which they wished to put it. Hurrah! cried the sailor, who did not disdain to celebrate thus his own triumph. With this we can go round the world? asked Gideon Spilett. No, the island. Some stones for ballast, a mast, and a sail, which the captain will make for us some day, and we shall go splendidly. Well, captain, and you, Mr. Spilett, and you, Herbert, and you, Neb, aren't you coming to try our new vessel? Come along. We must see if it will carry all five of us. This was certainly a trial which ought to be made. Pencroft soon brought the canoe to the shore by a narrow passage among the rocks, and it was agreed that they should make a trial of the boat that day by following the shore as far as the first point at which the rocks of the south ended. As they embarked, Neb cried, "'But your boat leaks rather, Pencroft!' "'That's nothing, Neb,' replied the sailor. "'The wood will get seasoned. In two days there won't be a single leak.' and our boat will have no more water in her than there is in the stomach of a drunkard. Jump in!" They were soon all seated, and Pencroft shoved off. The weather was magnificent, the sea as calm as if its waters were contained within the narrow limits of a lake. Thus the boat could proceed with as much security as if it was ascending the tranquil current of the Mercy. Neb took one of the oars, Herbert the other and Pencroft remained in the stern in order to use the skull. The sailor first crossed the channel, and steered close to the southern point of the islet. A light breeze blew from the south. No roughness was found either in the channel or the green sea. A long swell, which the canoe scarcely felt, as it was heavily laden, rolled regularly over the surface of the water. They pulled out about half a mile distant from the shore, that they might have a good view of Mount Franklin. Pencroft afterwards returned towards the mouth of the river. The boat then skirted the shore, which, extending to the extreme point, hid all Tadorn's fens. This point, of which the distance was increased by the irregularity of the coast, was nearly three miles from the Mercy. The settlers resolved to go to its extremity, and only go beyond it as much as was necessary to take a rapid survey of the coast as far as Claw Cape. The canoe followed the windings of the shore, avoiding the rocks which fringed it, and which the rising tide began to cover. The cliff gradually sloped away from the mouth of the river to the point. This was formed of granite rocks, capriciously distributed, very different from the cliff at Prospect Heights, and of an extremely wild aspect. It might have been said that an immense cartload of rocks had been emptied out there. There was no vegetation on this sharp promontory, which projected two miles from the forest, and it thus represented a giant's arm stretched out from a leafy sleeve. The canoe, impelled by the two oars, advanced without difficulty. Gideon Spilett, pencil in one hand and notebook in the other, sketched the coast in bold strokes. Neb, Herbert, and Pencroft chatted while examining this part of their domain, which was new to them, and in proportion as the canoe proceeded towards the south, the two mandible capes appeared to move, and surround Union Bay more closely. As to Cyrus Harding, he did not speak. He simply gazed, and by the mistrust which his look expressed, it appeared that he was examining some strange country. In the meantime, after a voyage of three-quarters of an hour, the canoe reached the extremity of the point, and Pencroft was preparing to return, when Herbert, rising, pointed to a black object, saying, "'What do I see down there on the beach?' All eyes turned towards the point indicated. "'Why,' said the reporter, "'there is something. It looks like part of a wreck half buried in the sand.' "'Ah!' cried Pencroft. "'I see what it is.' "'What?' asked Neb. 
"'Barrels, barrels, which perhaps are full,' replied the sailor. "'Pull to the shore, Pencroft,' said Cyrus. A few strokes of the oar brought the canoe into a little creek, and its passengers leaped on shore. Pencroft was not mistaken. Two barrels were there, half buried in the sand, but still firmly attached to a large chest, which, sustained by them, had floated to the moment when it stranded on the beach. "'There's been a wreck, then, in some part of the island,' said Herbert. "'Evidently,' replied Spilett. "'But what's in this chest?' cried Pencroft, with very natural impatience. "'What's in this chest? It is shut up, and nothing to open it with. Well, perhaps a stone.' And the sailor, raising a heavy block, was about to break in one of the sides of the chest when the engineer arrested his hand. "'Pencroft,' said he, "'can you restrain your impatience for one hour only?' "'But, Captain, just think, perhaps there is everything we want in there.' "'We shall find that out, Pencroft,' replied the engineer. "'But trust to me, and do not break the chest, which may be useful to us. We must convey it to Granite House, where we can open it easily, and without breaking it. It is quite prepared for a voyage, and since it has floated here, it may just as well float to the mouth of the river.' "'You're right, Captain, and I was wrong, as usual,' replied the sailor. The engineer's advice was good. In fact, the canoe probably would not have been able to contain the articles possibly enclosed in the chest, which doubtless was heavy, since two empty barrels were required to buoy it up. It was therefore much better to tow it to the beach at Granite House. And now, whence had this chest come? That was the important question. Cyrus Harding and his companions looked attentively around them, and examined the shore for several hundred steps. No other articles or pieces of wreck could be found. Herbert and Neb climbed a high rock to survey the sea. But there was nothing in sight, neither a dismasted vessel nor a ship under sail. However, there was no doubt that there had been a wreck. Perhaps this incident was connected with that of the bullet? Perhaps strangers had landed on another part of the island. Perhaps they were still there. But the thought which came naturally to the settlers was that these strangers could not be Malay pirates, for the chest was evidently of American or European make. All the party returned to the chest, which was of an unusually large size. It was made of oak wood, very carefully closed, and covered with a thick hide, which was secured by copper nails. The two great barrels, hermetically sealed, but which sounded hollow and empty, were fastened to its sides by strong ropes, knotted with a skill which Pencroft directly pronounced sailors alone could exhibit. It appeared to be in a perfect state of preservation, which was explained by the fact that it had stranded on a sandy beach, and not among rocks. They had no doubt whatever, on examining it carefully, that it had not been long in the water, and that its arrival on this coast was recent. The water did not appear to have penetrated to the inside, and the articles which it contained were no doubt uninjured. It was evident that this chest had been thrown overboard from some dismasted vessel driven towards the island, and that, in the hope that it would reach the land, where they might afterwards find it, the passengers had taken the precaution to buoy it up by means of this floating apparatus. "'We will tow this chest to Granite House,' said the engineer, "'where we can make an inventory of its contents. Then, if we discover any of the survivors from the supposed wreck, we can return it to those to whom it belongs. If we find no one, we will keep it for ourselves,' cried Pencroft. "'But what in the world can there be in it?' The sea was already approaching the chest, and the high tide would evidently float it. One of the ropes which fastened the barrels was partly unlashed, and used as a cable to unite the floating apparatus with the canoe. Pencroft and Neb then dug away the sand with their oars, so as to facilitate the moving of the chest, towing which the boat soon began to double the point, to which the name of Flotsam Point was given. The chest was heavy and the barrels were scarcely sufficient to keep it above water. The sailor also feared every instant that it would get loose and sink to the bottom of the sea. But happily his fears were not realized, and an hour and a half after they set out, 
all that time had been taken up in going a distance of three miles, the boat touched the beach below Granite House. Canoe and chest were then hauled up on the sands, and as the tide was then going out, they were soon left high and dry. Neb, hurrying home, brought back some tools with which to open the chest in such a way that it might be injured as little as possible, and they proceeded to its inventory. Pencroft did not try to hide that he was greatly excited. The sailor began by detaching the two barrels, which, being in good condition, would of course be of use. Then the locks were forced with a cold chisel and a hammer, and the lid thrown back. A second casing of zinc lined the interior of the chest, which had been evidently arranged that the articles which it enclosed might under any circumstances be sheltered from damp. Oh! cried Neb. Suppose it's jam! I hope not, replied the reporter. If only there was, said the sailor in a low voice. What? asked Neb, who overheard him. Nothing. The covering of zinc was torn off and thrown back over the sides of the chest, and by degrees numerous articles of very varied character were produced and strewn about on the sand. At each new object Pencroft uttered fresh hurrahs, Herbert clapped his hands, and Neb danced up and down. There were books which made Herbert wild with joy, and cooking utensils which Neb covered with kisses. In short, the colonists had reason to be extremely satisfied, for this chest contained tools, weapons, instruments, clothes, books, and this is the exact list of them as stated in Gideon Spilett's notebook. Tools. Three knives with several blades. Two woodman's axes. Two carpenter's hatchets. Three planes. Two adzes. One twibill or mattock. Six chisels. Two files. Three hammers. Three gimlets. Two augers. Ten bags of nails and screws. Three saws of different sizes. Two boxes of needles. Weapons. Two flintlock guns two for percussion caps, two breech-loader carbines, five boarding cutlasses, four sabres, two barrels of powder, each containing twenty-five pounds, twelve boxes of percussion caps. Instruments. One sextant, one double opera glass, one telescope, one box of mathematical instruments, one mariner's compass, one Fahrenheit thermometer, one aneroid barometer, one box containing a photographic apparatus, object glass, plates, chemicals, etc. Clothes. Two dozen shirts of a peculiar material resembling wool, but evidently of a vegetable origin. Three dozen stockings of the same material. Utensils. One iron pot, six copper saucepans, three iron dishes, ten metal plates, two kettles, one portable stove, six table knives books, one Bible, one atlas, one dictionary of the different Polynesian idioms, one dictionary of natural science in six volumes, three reams of white paper, two books with blank pages. It must be allowed, said the reporter, after the inventory had been made, that the owner of this chest was a practical man. Tools, weapons, instruments, clothes, utensils, books. Nothing is wanting. It might really be said that he expected to be wrecked, and had prepared for it beforehand. "'Nothing is wanting, indeed,' murmured Cyrus Harding thoughtfully. "'And for a certainty,' added Herbert, "'the vessel which carried this chest and its owner was not a melee pirate.' "'Unless,' said Pencroft, "'the owner had been taken prisoner by pirates.' "'That is not admissible,' replied the reporter. It is more probable that an American or European vessel has been driven into this quarter, and that her passengers, wishing to save necessaries at least, prepared this chest and threw it overboard. "'Is that your opinion, Captain?' asked Herbert. "'Yes, my boy,' replied the engineer. "'That may have been the case. It is possible that at the moment, or in expectation of a wreck, they collected into this chest different articles of the greatest use in hopes of finding again on the coast. "'Even the photographic box!' exclaimed the sailor incredulously. 
"'As to that apparatus,' replied Harding, "'I do not quite see the use of it, and a more complete supply of clothes, or more abundant ammunition, would have been more valuable to us as well as to any other castaways. But isn't there any mark or direction on these instruments, tools, or books which would tell us something about them?' asked Gideon Spilett. "'That might be ascertained. Each article was carefully examined, especially the books, instruments, and weapons. Neither the weapons nor the instruments, contrary to the usual custom, bore the name of the maker. They were, besides, in a perfect state, and did not appear to have been used. The same peculiarity marked the tools and utensils. All were new, which proved that the articles had not been taken by chance and thrown into the chest, but, on the contrary, that the choice of things had been well considered and arranged with care. This was also indicated by the second case of metal which had preserved them from damp, and which could not have been soldered in a moment of haste. As to the dictionaries of natural science and Polynesian idioms, both were English, but they neither bore the name of the publisher nor the date of publication. The same with the Bible printed in English, in quarto, remarkable from a typographic point of view, and which appeared to have been often used. The atlas was a magnificent work, comprising maps of every country in the world, and several planispheres arranged upon Mercator's projection, and of which the nomenclature was in French, but which also bore neither date nor name of publisher. There was nothing, therefore, on these different articles by which they could be traced, and nothing consequently of a nature to show the nationality of the vessel which must have recently passed these shores. But wherever the chest might have come from, it was a treasure to the settlers on Lincoln Island. Till then, by making use of the productions of nature, they had created everything for themselves, and, thanks to their intelligence, they had managed without difficulty. But did it not appear as if Providence had wished to reward them by sending them these productions of human industry? Their thanks rose unanimously to heaven. However, one of them was not quite satisfied. It was Pencroft. It appeared that the chest did not contain something which he evidently held in great esteem, for in proportion as they approached the bottom of the box, his hurrahs diminished in hardiness, and, the inventory finished, he was heard to mutter these words, that's all very fine, but you can see that there is nothing for me in that box. This led Neb to say, Why, friend Pencroft, what more do you expect? Half a pound of tobacco, replied Pencroft seriously, and nothing would have been wanting to complete my happiness. No one could help laughing at this speech of the sailors. But the result of this discovery of the chest was, that it was now more than ever necessary to explore the island thoroughly. It was therefore agreed that the next morning at break of day they should set out by ascending the Mercy so as to reach the western shore. If any castaways had landed on the coast, it was to be feared they were without resources, and it was therefore the more necessary to carry help to them without delay. During the day the different articles were carried to Granite House, where they were methodically arranged in the Great Hall. This day, the 29th of October, happened to be a Sunday, and before going to bed, Herbert asked the engineer if he would not read them something from the Gospel. Willingly, replied Cyrus Harding. He took the sacred volume, and was about to open it, when Pencroft stopped him, saying, Captain, I am superstitious. Open at random, and read the first verse which your eye falls upon. We will see if it applies to our situation." Cyrus Harding smiled at the sailor's idea, and, yielding to his wish, he opened exactly at a place where the leaves were separated by a marker. Immediately his eyes were attracted by a cross, which, made with a pencil, was placed against the eighth verse of the seventh chapter of the Gospel of St. Matthew. He read the verse, which was this, For every one that asketh, receiveth, and he that seeketh, findeth. End of chapter. The Mysterious Island 
by Jules Verne, Part Two, Chapter Three. The next day, the thirtieth of October, all was ready for the proposed exploring expedition which recent events had rendered so necessary. In fact, things had so come about that the settlers in Lincoln Island no longer needed help for themselves, but were even able to carry it to others. It was therefore agreed that they should ascend the Mercy as far as the river was navigable. A great part of the distance would thus be traversed without fatigue, and the explorers could transport their provisions and arms to an advanced point in the west of the island. It was necessary to think not only of the things which they should take with them, but also of those which they might have by chance to bring back to Granite House. If there had been a wreck on the coast, as was supposed, there would be many things cast up, which would be lawfully their prizes. In the event of this, the cart would have been of more use than the light canoe, but it was heavy and clumsy to drag, and therefore more difficult to use. This led Pencroft to express his regret that the chest had not contained, besides his half-pound of tobacco, a pair of strong New Jersey horses, which would have been very useful to the colony. The provisions which Neb had already packed up consisted of a store of meat and of several gallons of beer, that is to say, enough to sustain them for three days, the time which Harding assigned for the expedition. They hoped, besides, to supply themselves on the road and Neb took care not to forget the portable stove. The only tools the settlers took were the two woodmen's axes, which they could use to cut a path through the thick forests, as also the instruments, the telescope and pocket compass. For weapons they selected the two flintlock guns, which were likely to be more useful to them than the percussion fowling pieces, the first only requiring flints, which could be easily replaced, and the latter needing fulminating caps, a frequent use of which would soon exhaust their limited stock. However, they took also one of the carbines and some cartridges. As to the powder, of which there was about fifty pounds in the barrel, a small supply of it had to be taken, but the engineer hoped to manufacture an explosive substance which would allow them to husband it. To the firearms were added the five cutlasses, well sheathed in leather, and, thus supplied, the settlers could venture into the vast forest with some chance of success. It is useless to add that Pencroft, Herbert, and Neb, thus armed, were at the summit of their happiness, although Cyrus Harding made them promise not to fire a shot unless it was necessary. At six in the morning the canoe put off from the shore. All had embarked, including Top, and they proceeded to the mouth of the Mercy. The tide had begun to come up half an hour before. For several hours, therefore, there would be a current which it was well to profit by, for later the ebb would make it difficult to ascend the river. The tide was already strong, for in three days the moon would be full, and it was enough to keep the boat in the centre of the current, where it floated swiftly along between the high banks without it being necessary to increase its speed by the aid of the oars. In a few minutes the explorers arrived at the angle formed by the Mercy, and exactly at the place where, seven months before, Pencroft had made his first raft of wood. After this sudden angle the river widened and flowed under the shade of great evergreen firs. The aspect of the banks was magnificent. Cyrus Harding and his companions could not but admire the lovely effects so easily produced by nature with water and trees. As they advanced, the forest element diminished. On the right bank of the river grew magnificent specimens of the Olmaceae tribe, the precious elm, so valuable to builders, and which withstands well the action of water. Then there were numerous groups belonging to the same family, among others one in particular, the fruit of which produces a very useful oil. Further on, Herbert remarked the Lardizabala, a twining shrub which, when bruised in water, furnishes excellent cordage, and two or three ebony trees of a beautiful black, crossed with capricious veins. From time to time, in certain places where the landing was easy, the canoe was stopped, when Gideon Spilett, Herbert, and Pencroft, their guns in their hands, and preceded by Top, jumped on shore. Without expecting game, some useful plant might be met with, 
and the young naturalist was delighted with discovering a sort of wild spinach, belonging to the order of Chinopodiaceae, and numerous specimens of cruciferae, belonging to the cabbage tribe, which it would certainly be possible to cultivate by transplanting. There were cresses, horseradish, turnips, and lastly, little branching hairy stalks, scarcely more than three feet high, which produced brownish grains. "'Do you know what this plant is?' asked Herbert of the sailor. "'Tobacco!' cried Pencroft, who evidently had never seen his favourite plant except in the bowl of his pipe. "'No, Pencroft,' replied Herbert. "'This is not tobacco. It is mustard.' "'Mustard be hanged!' returned the sailor. "'But if by chance you happen to come across a tobacco plant, my boy, pray don't scorn that.' "'We shall find it some day,' said Gideon Spillet. "'Well!' exclaimed Pencroft. "'When that day comes, I do not know what more will be wanting in our island.' These different plants, which had been carefully rooted up, were carried to the canoe, where Cyrus Harding had remained buried in thought. The reporter, Herbert and Pencroft, in this manner, frequently disembarked, sometimes on the right bank, sometimes on the left bank of the Mercy. The latter was less abrupt, but the former more wooded, the engineer ascertained by consulting his pocket compass that the direction of the river from the first turn was obviously southwest and northeast, and nearly straight for a length of about three miles. But it was to be supposed that this direction changed beyond that point, and that the Mercy continued to the northwest, towards the spurs of Mount Franklin, among which the river rose. During one of these excursions Gideon Spilett managed to get hold of two couples of living Gallinaceae. They were birds with long, thin beaks, lengthened necks, short wings, and without any appearance of a tail. Herbert rightly gave them the name of Tinamous, and it was resolved that they should be the first tenants of their future poultry-yard. But till then the guns had not spoken and the first report which awoke the echoes of the forest of the far west was provoked by the appearance of a beautiful bird resembling the kingfisher. "'I recognize him!' cried Bancroft, and it seemed as if his gun went off by itself. "'What do you recognize?' asked the reporter. "'The bird which escaped us on our first excursion, and from which we gave the name to that part of the forest. "'A jacamar!' cried Herbert. It was indeed a jacamar of which the plumage shines with a metallic luster. A shot brought it to the ground, and Top carried it to the canoe. At the same time half a dozen lorries were brought down. The lorry is the size of a pigeon, the plumage dashed with green, part of the wings crimson, and its crest bordered with white. To the young boy belonged the honour of this shot, and he was proud enough of it. Lorries are better food than the jacamar the flesh of which is rather tough. But it was difficult to persuade Pencroft that he had not killed the king of eatable birds. It was ten o'clock in the morning, when the canoe reached a second angle of the Mercy, nearly five miles from its mouth. Here a halt was made for breakfast, under the shade of some splendid trees. The river still measured from sixty to seventy feet in breadth, and its bed from five to six feet in depth. The engineer had observed that it was increased by numerous affluents, but they were unnavigable, being simply little streams. As to the forest, including Jacamar Wood, as well as the forests of the far west, it extended as far as the eye could reach. In no place, either in the depths of the forests or under the trees on the banks of the Mercy, was the presence of man revealed. The explorers could not discover one suspicious trace. It was evident that the woodman's axe had never touched these trees, that the pioneer's knife had never severed the creepers hanging from one trunk to another in the midst of tangled brushwood and long grass. If castaways had landed on the island, they could not have yet quitted the shore, and it was not in the woods that the survivors of the supposed shipwreck should be sought. The engineer therefore manifested some impatience to reach the western coast of Lincoln Island, which was at least five miles distant, according to his estimation. The voyage was continued. 
and as the mercy appeared to flow not towards the shore but rather towards mount franklin it was decided that they should use the boat as long as there was enough water under its keel to float it it was both fatigue spared and time gained for they would have been obliged to cut a path through the thick wood with their axes but soon the flow completely failed them either the tide was going down and it was about the hour or it could no longer be felt at this distance from the mouth of the mercy they had therefore to make use of the oars herbert and neb each took one and pencroft took the skull the forest soon became less dense the trees grew further apart and often quite isolated but the further they were from each other the more magnificent they appeared profiting as they did by the free pure air which circulated around them what splendid specimens of the flora of this latitude certainly their presence would have been enough for a botanist to name without hesitation the parallel which traversed lincoln island eucalypti cried herbert they were in fact those splendid trees the giants of the extra-tropical zone the congeners of the australian and new zealand eucalyptus both situated under the same latitude as lincoln island some rose to a height of two hundred feet their trunks at the base measured twenty feet in circumference and their bark was covered by a network of furrows containing a red sweet-smelling gum nothing is more wonderful or more singular than those enormous specimens of the order of the myrtaceae with their leaves placed vertically and not horizontally so that an edge and not a surface looks upward the effect being that the sun's rays penetrate more freely among the trees the ground at the foot of the eucalypti was carpeted with grass and from the bushes escaped flights of little birds which glittered in the sunlight like winged rubies these are something like trees cried neb but are they good for anything pooh replied pencroft of course there are vegetable giants as well as human giants and they are no good except to show themselves at fairs i think that you are mistaken pencroft replied gideon spilett and that the wood of the eucalyptus has begun to be very advantageously employed in cabinet-making and i may add said herbert that the eucalyptus belongs to a family which comprises many useful members the guava tree from whose fruit guava jelly is made the clove tree which produces the spice the pomegranate tree which bears pomegranates the eugca colliflora the fruit of which is used in making a tolerable wine the ugui myrtle which contains an excellent alcoholic liquor the caryophyllus myrtle of which the bark forms an esteemed cinnamon the eugenia permenta from whence comes jamaica pepper the common myrtle from whose buds and berries spice is sometimes made the eucalyptus manifera which yields a sweet sort of manna the guinea eucalyptus the sap of which is transformed into beer by fermentation in short all those trees known under the name of gum trees or iron bark trees in australia belong to this family of the myrtaceae which contains forty-six genera and thirteen hundred species the lad was allowed to run on and he delivered his little botanical lecture with great animation cyrus harding listened smiling and pencroft with an indescribable feeling of pride very good herbert replied pencroft but i could swear that all those useful specimens you have just told us about are none of them giants like these that is true pencroft that supports what i said returned the sailor namely that these giants are good for nothing there you are wrong pencroft said the engineer these gigantic eucalypti which shelter us are good for something and what is that to render the countries which they inhabit healthy do you know what they are called in australia and new zealand no captain they are called fever trees because they give fevers no because they prevent them good i must note that said the reporter note it then my dear spilett 
for it appears proved that the presence of the eucalyptus is enough to neutralize miasmas. This natural antidote has been tried in certain countries in the middle of Europe and the north of Africa, where the soil was absolutely unhealthy, and the sanitary condition of the inhabitants has been gradually ameliorated. No more intermittent fevers prevail in the regions now covered with forests of the Myrtaceae. This fact is now beyond doubt, and it is a happy circumstance for us settlers in Lincoln Island. "'Ah, what an island! What a blessed island!' cried Pencroft. "'I tell you, it wants nothing, unless it is—' "'That will come, Pencroft, that will be found,' replied the engineer. "'But now we must continue our voyage, and push on as far as the river will carry our boat.' The exploration was therefore continued for another two miles in the midst of country covered with eucalypti which predominated in the woods of this portion of the island. The space which they occupied extended as far as the eye could reach on each side of the Mercy, which wound along between high green banks. The bed was often obstructed by long weeds, and even by pointed rocks, which rendered the navigation very difficult. The action of the oars was prevented, and Pencroft was obliged to push with a pole. They found also that the water was becoming shallower and shallower, and that the canoe must soon stop. The sun was already sinking towards the horizon, and the trees threw long shadows on the ground. Cyrus Harding, seeing that he could not hope to reach the western coast of the island in one journey, resolved to camp at the place where any further navigation was prevented by want of water. He calculated that they were still five or six miles from the coast, and this distance was too great for them to attempt during the night in the midst of unknown woods. The boat was pushed on through the forest, which gradually became thicker again, and appeared also to have more inhabitants, for if the eyes of the sailor did not deceive him, he thought he saw bands of monkeys springing among the trees. Sometimes even two or three of these animals stopped at a little distance from the canoe, and gazed at the settlers without manifesting any terror, as if, seeing men for the first time, they had not yet learned to fear them. It would have been easy to bring down one of these quadrumani with a gunshot, and Pencroft was greatly tempted to fire, but Harding opposed so useless a massacre. This was prudent, for the monkeys, or apes rather, appearing to be very powerful and extremely active, it was useless to provoke an unnecessary aggression, and the creatures might, ignorant of the power of the explorer's firearms, have attacked them. It is true that the sailor considered the monkeys from a purely elementary point of view, for those animals which are herbivorous make very excellent game, but since they had an abundant supply of provisions, it was a pity to waste their ammunition. Towards four o'clock, the navigation of the Mercy became exceedingly difficult, for its course was obstructed by aquatic plants and rocks. The banks rose higher and higher, and already they were approaching the spurs of Mount Franklin. The source could not be far off, since it was fed by the water from the southern slopes of the mountain. "'In a quarter of an hour,' said the sailor, "'we shall be obliged to stop, Captain.' "'Very well, we will stop, Bancroft, and we will make our encampment for the night.' "'At what distance are we from Granite House?' asked Herbert. "'About seven miles,' replied the engineer, taking into calculation, however, the detours of the river, which has carried us to the northwest. "'Shall we go on?' asked the reporter. "'Yes, as long as we can,' replied Cyrus Harding. "'Tomorrow, at break of day,' We will leave the canoe, and in two hours I hope we shall cross the distance which separates us from the coast, and then we shall have the whole day in which to explore the shore. "'Go ahead,' replied Bancroft. But soon the boat grated on the stony bottom of the river, which was now not more than twenty feet in breadth. The trees met like a bower overhead, and caused a half-darkness. They also heard the noise of a waterfall which showed that a few hundred feet up the river there was a natural barrier. Presently, 
after a sudden turn of the river, a cascade appeared through the trees. The canoe again touched the bottom, and in a few minutes it was moored to a trunk near the right bank. It was nearly five o'clock. The last rays of the sun gleamed through the thick foliage, and glanced on the little waterfall, making the spray sparkle with all the colors of the rainbow. Beyond that, the mercy was lost in the brushwood, where it was fed from some hidden source. The different streams which flowed into it increased it to a regular river further down, but here it was simply a shallow, limpid brook. It was agreed to camp here, as the place was charming. The colonists disembarked, and a fire was soon lighted under a clump of trees, among the branches of which Cyrus Harding and his companions could, if it was necessary, take refuge for the night. Supper was quickly devoured, for they were very hungry, and then there was only sleeping to think of. But, as roarings of rather a suspicious nature had been heard during the evening, a good fire was made up for the night, so as to protect the sleepers with its crackling flames. Neb and Pencroft also watched by turns, and did not spare fuel. They thought they saw the dark forms of some wild animals prowling round the camp among the bushes, but the night passed without incident, and the next day, the thirty-first of October, at five o'clock in the morning, all were on foot, ready for a start. End of chapter The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne Part Two, Chapter Four it was six o'clock in the morning when the settlers, after a hasty breakfast, set out to reach by the shortest way the western coast of the island. And how long would it take to do this? Cyrus Harding had said two hours, but of course that depended on the nature of the obstacles they might meet with. As it was probable that they would have to cut a path through the grass, shrubs, and creepers, they marched axe in hand, and with guns also ready, wisely taking warning from the cries of the wild beasts heard in the night. The exact position of the encampment could be determined by the bearing of Mount Franklin, and as the volcano arose in the north at a distance of less than three miles, they had only to go straight towards the southwest to reach the western coast. They set out, having first carefully secured the canoe. Pencroft and Neb carried sufficient provision for the little band for at least two days. It would not thus be necessary to hunt. The engineer advised his companions to refrain from firing, that their presence might not be betrayed to any one near the shore. The first hatchet blows were given among the brushwood in the midst of some mastic trees, a little above the cascade, and his compass in his hand, Cyrus Harding led the way. The forest here was composed for the most part of trees which had already been met with near the lake and on Prospect Heights. There were deodars, Douglas firs, casuarinas, gum trees, eucalypti, hibiscus, cedars, and other trees, generally of a moderate size, for their number prevented their growth. Since their departure, the settlers had descended the slopes, which constituted the mountain system of the island, onto a dry soil, but the luxuriant vegetation of which indicated it to be watered either by some subterranean marsh or by some stream. However, Cyrus Harding did not remember having seen, at the time of his excursion to the crater, any other watercourses but the Red Creek and the Mercy. During the first part of their excursion they saw numerous troops of monkeys who exhibited great astonishment at the sight of men, whose appearance was so new to them. Gideon Spilett jokingly asked whether these active and merry quadrupeds did not consider him and his companions as degenerate brothers. And certainly pedestrians, hindered at each step by bushes, caught by creepers, barred by trunks of trees, did not shine beside those supple animals, who, bounding from branch to branch, were hindered by nothing on their course. The monkeys were numerous, but happily they did not manifest any hostile disposition. Several pigs, agoutis, kangaroos, and other rodents were seen, also two or three koalas, at which Pencroft longed to have a shot. "'But,' said he, "'you may jump and play just now. We shall have one or two words to say to you on our way back.' 
At half past nine the way was suddenly found to be barred by an unknown stream, from thirty to forty feet broad, whose rapid current dashed foaming over the numerous rocks which interrupted its course. This creek was deep and clear, but it was absolutely unnavigable. "'We are cut off!' cried Neb. "'No,' replied Herbert. "'It is only a stream, and we can easily swim over.' "'What would be the use of that?' returned Harding. "'This creek evidently runs to the sea. Let us remain on this side and follow the bank, and I shall be much astonished if it does not lead us very quickly to the coast. Forward!' "'One minute.' said the reporter. The name of this creek, my friends. Do not let us leave our geography incomplete. All right, said Pencroft. Name it, my boy, said the engineer, addressing the lad. Will it not be better to wait until we have explored it to its mouth? answered Herbert. Very well, replied Cyrus Harding. Let us follow it as fast as we can, without stopping. Still another minute, said Pencroft. What's the matter? asked the reporter. "'Though hunting is forbidden, fishing is allowed, I suppose,' said the sailor. "'We have no time to lose,' replied the engineer. "'Oh, five minutes,' replied Pencroft. "'I only ask for five minutes to use in the interest of our breakfast.' And Pencroft, lying down on the bank, plunged his arm into the water, and soon pulled up several dozen of fine crayfish from among the stones. "'These will be good!' cried Neb, going to the sailor's aid. "'As I said, there is everything in this island, except tobacco,' muttered Pencroft, with a sigh. The fishing did not take five minutes, for the crayfish were swarming in the creek. A bag was filled with crustacea, whose shells were of a cobalt blue. The settlers then pushed on. They advanced more rapidly and easily along the banks of the river than in the forest. From time to time they came upon the traces of animals of a large size who had come to quench their thirst at the stream, but none were actually seen, and it was evidently not in this part of the forest that the peccary had received the bullet which had cost Pencroft a grinder. In the meanwhile, considering the rapid current, Harding was led to suppose that he and his companions were much farther from the western coast than they had at first supposed. In fact, at this hour, the rising tide would have turned back the current of the creek, if its mouth had only been a few miles distant. Now this effect was not produced, and the water pursued its natural course. The engineer was much astonished at this, and frequently consulted his compass, to assure himself that some turn of the river was not leading them again into the far west. However, the creek gradually widened, and its waters became less tumultuous. The trees on the right bank were as close together as on the left bank, and it was impossible to distinguish anything beyond them. But these masses of wood were evidently uninhabited, for Top did not bark, and the intelligent animal would not have failed to signal the presence of any stranger in the neighborhood. At half-past ten, to the great surprise of Cyrus Harding, Herbert, who was a little in front, suddenly stopped and exclaimed, "'The sea!' In a few minutes more the whole western shore of the island lay extended before the eyes of the settlers. But what a contrast between this and the eastern coast upon which chance had first thrown them! No granite cliff, no rocks, not even a sandy beach. The forest reached the shore, and the tall trees bending over the water were beaten by the waves. It was not such a shore as is usually formed by nature either by extending a vast carpet of sand, or by grouping masses of rock, but a beautiful border consisting of the most splendid trees. The bank was raised a little above the level of the sea, and on this luxuriant soil, supported by a granite base, the fine forest trees seemed to be as firmly planted as in the interior of the island. The colonists were then on the shore of an unimportant little harbour which would scarcely have contained even two or three fishing boats. It served as a neck to the new creek, of which the curious thing was that its waters, instead of joining the sea by a gentle slope, fell from a height of more than forty feet, which explained why the rising tide was not felt up the stream. In fact, the tides of the Pacific, even at their maximum elevation, could never reach the level of the river, and doubtless, 
Millions of years would pass before the water would have worn away the granite and hollowed a practicable mouth. It was settled that the name of Falls River should be given to this stream. Beyond, towards the north, the forest border was prolonged for a space of nearly two miles. Then the trees became scarcer, and beyond that again the picturesque heights described a nearly straight line, which ran north and south. On the contrary, all the part of the shore between Falls River and Reptile End was a mass of wood, magnificent trees, some straight, others bent, so that the long sea swell bathed their roots. Now it was this coast, that is, all the Serpentine Peninsula, that was to be explored, for this part of the shore offered a refuge to castaways, which the other wild and barren side must have refused. The weather was fine and clear, and from the height of a hillock on which Neb and Pencroft had arranged breakfast, a wide view was obtained. There was, however, not a sail in sight. Nothing could be seen along the shore, as far as the eye could reach. But the engineer would take nothing for granted until he had explored the coast to the very extremity of the Serpentine Peninsula. Breakfast was soon dispatched and at half-past eleven the captain gave the signal for departure. Instead of proceeding over the summit of a cliff or along a sandy beach, the settlers were obliged to remain under cover of the trees so that they might continue on the shore. The distance which separated Falls River from Reptile End was about twelve miles. It would have taken the settlers four hours to do this on a clear ground and without hurrying themselves, but as it was they needed double the time for what with trees to go round, bushes to cut down, and creepers to chop away, they were impeded at every step, these obstacles greatly lengthening their journey. There was, however, nothing to show that a shipwreck had taken place recently. It is true that, as Gideon Spilett observed, any remains of it might have drifted out to sea, and they might not take it for granted that because they could find no traces of it, a ship had not been cast away on the coast. The porter's argument was just, and besides, the incident of the bullet proved that a shot must have been fired in Lincoln Island within three months. It was already five o'clock, and there were still two miles between the settlers and the extremity of the Serpentine Peninsula. It was evident that after having reached Reptile End, Harding and his companions would not have time to return before dark to their encampment near the source of the Mercy. It would therefore be necessary to pass the night on the promontory. But they had no lack of provisions, which was lucky, for there were no animals on the shore, though birds, on the contrary, abounded. Jacamars, curacoos, tragopans, grouse, lories, parrots, cockatoos, pheasants, pigeons, and a hundred others. There was not a tree without a nest, and not a nest which was not full of flapping wings. Towards seven o'clock, the weary explorers arrived at Reptile End. Here the seaside forest ended, and the shore resumed the customary appearance of a coast, with rocks, reefs, and sands. It was possible that something might be found here, but darkness came on, and the further exploration had to be put off to the next day. Pencroft and Herbert hastened on to find a suitable place for their camp. Among the last trees of the forest of the far west, the boy found several thick clumps of bamboos. Good, said he. This is a valuable discovery. Valuable, returned Pencroft. Certainly, replied Herbert. I may say, Pencroft, that the bark of the bamboo, cut into flexible laths, is used for making baskets, that this bark, mashed into a paste, is used for the manufacture of Chinese paper that the stalks furnish, according to their size, canes and pipes, and are used for conducting water, that large bamboos make excellent material for building, being light and strong, and being never attacked by insects. I will add that by sawing the bamboo in two at the joint, keeping for the bottom the part of the transverse film which forms the joint, useful cups are obtained, which are much in use among the Chinese. No, you don't care for that, but... But what? But I can tell you, if you are ignorant of it, that in India these bamboos are eaten like asparagus. Asparagus thirty feet high! exclaimed the sailor. And are they good? 
Excellent, replied Herbert. Only is not the stems of thirty feet high which are eaten, but the young shoots. Perfect, my boy, perfect, replied Pencroft. I will also add that the pith of the young stalks, preserved in vinegar, makes a good pickle. Better and better, Herbert. And lastly, that the bamboos exude a sweet liquor which can be made into a very agreeable drink. Is that all? asked the sailor. That is all. And they don't happen to do for smoking? No, my poor Pencroft. Herbert and the sailor had not to look long for a place in which to pass the night. The rocks, which must have been violently beaten by the sea under the influence of the winds of the southwest, presented many cavities in which shelter could be found against the night air. But just as they were about to enter one of these caves, a loud roaring arrested them. Back! cried Pencroft. Our guns are only loaded with small shot, and beasts which can roar as loud as that would care no more for it than for grains of salt. And the sailor, seizing Herbert by the arm, dragged him behind a rock, just as a magnificent animal showed itself at the entrance of the cavern. It was a jaguar of a size at least equal to its Asiatic congeners. That is to say, it measured five feet from the extremity of its head to the beginning of its tail. The yellow color of its hair was relieved by streaks and regular oblong spots of black, which contrasted with the white of its chest. Herbert recognized it as the ferocious rival of the tiger, as formidable as the puma, which is the rival of the largest wolf. The jaguar advanced, and gazed around him with blazing eyes, his hair bristling as if this was not the first time he had scented men. At this moment the reporter appeared round a rock, and Herbert, thinking that he had not seen the jaguar, was about to rush towards him, when Gideon Spilett signed to him to remain where he was. This was not his first tiger, and advancing to within ten feet of the animal, he remained motionless, his gun to his shoulder, without moving a muscle. The jaguar collected itself for a spring, but at that moment a shot struck it in the eyes, and it fell dead. Herbert and Pencroft rushed towards the jaguar. Neb and Harding also ran up, and they remained for some instants contemplating the animal as it lay stretched on the ground, thinking that its magnificent skin would be a great ornament to the hall at Granite House. "'Oh, Mr. Spilett, how I admire and envy you!' cried Herbert, in a fit of very natural enthusiasm. "'Well, my boy,' replied the reporter, "'you could have done the same.' "'I, with such coolness!' Imagine to yourself, Herbert, that the jaguar is only a hare, and you would fire as quietly as possible. That is, rejoined Pencroft, that it is not more dangerous than a hare. And now, said Gideon Spilett, since the jaguar has left its abode, I do not see, my friends, why we should not take possession of it for the night. But others may come, said Pencroft. It will be enough to light a fire at the entrance of the cavern, said the reporter, and no wild beast will dare to cross the threshold. Into the jaguar's house, then, replied the sailor, dragging after him the body of the animal. While Neb skid in the jaguar, his companions collected abundant supply of dry wood from the forest, which they heaped up at the cave. Cyrus Harding, seeing the clump of bamboos, cut a quantity, which he mingled with the other fuel. This done, they entered the grotto, of which the floor was strewn with bones. The guns were carefully loaded, in case of a sudden attack. They had supper, and then just before they lay down to rest, the heap of wood piled at the entrance was set fire to. Immediately a regular explosion, or rather a series of reports, broke the silence. The noise was caused by the bamboos, which, as the flames reached them, exploded like fireworks. The noise was enough to terrify even the boldest of wild beasts. It was not the engineer who had invented this way of causing loud explosions, for, according to Marco Polo, the Tartars have employed it for many centuries to drive away from their encampments the formidable wild beasts of Central Asia. End of chapter